Hi, I'm Mark Heim, founder of Disaster Doc. I help people all over the world to better understand disasters so they can protect themselves and others. Today I'd like to talk to you about disaster planning. I hope to give you an overview of the basics and also to maybe even teach you something new. During the live session, we asked, why are we here and who are we? So, where are we now? <clears throat> Unfortunately, we find ourselves in a situation where disasters are becoming more frequent. Disasters are also becoming more severe as billion dollar disasters increase in frequency and cost. This is a figure from my new book chapter on climate-related disasters, and here we see the number of disasters related to extreme weather events have been increasing worldwide for over 50 years. The U.S. National Framework has identified several criteria that help us to measure the key aspects of response planning quality, and these include acceptability, adequacy, completeness, consistency, and standardization of products, as well as feasibility of the plan and flexibility, interoperability, and collaboration. But unfortunately, our studies have also identified multiple problems associated with planning in particular. There are challenges associated with the resources that are needed for planning and also the lack of guidance and experience related to planning. Without going into all those planning shortfalls, we know that the planning process is already relatively cumbersome, labor intensive, and also there are very few measures of effectiveness. And one of the most worrisome findings is that plans are simply not used. These two studies noted in this slide are actually 20 years old, but represent pretty much all of the same literature that has occurred since that period of time. It's dumb to not use a disaster plan. If you don't have a well thought out plan, we're forced to quickly form some sort of hypothesis and then act upon it without really testing it first. Now, this is the perfect example of unscientific decision making. But on the other hand, people have given some thought to the process of scientific decision making. De Groot said that we need to form a hypothesis, that's also known as a best guess. And then we create an experiment, and we test the hypothesis, and then we take steps to improve this decision. Deming described the cycle simply as plan, do, check, act. And this has also been called the PDCA cycle. But seriously, we have to ask ourselves, why are there so many problems? And one of the main reasons is that we operate under a false set of assumptions. The reality is planning is often not done well. Written plans are rarely used, and one person's experience is not as good as many people's experience. We therefore need additional steps to help us try to stay on track. The first step is evidence-based decision-making. The second is an information management system. And the third is the use of collaborative networks. There is a need for evidence-based decision-making, information management, and collaborative networks to be implemented in our own disaster planning. We need standard models of practice that can be measured for effectiveness and efficiency. We need to pay more attention to the process of group decision-making and its effect on multi-agency planning. And with respect to information management, there also needs to be a standardization of the way that we exchange information. We need to make use of the semantic web. It's otherwise known as the Internet of Things. And we need to modernize the way that we collaborate and improve plans. In short, modern problems require modern solutions and much of the plan writing should be automated in a wizard style approach. 
It should also be cloud-based with accessibility and cybersecurity with compartmentalization for a need-to-know basis. And finally, planning should have quality measures built into the routine workflow so that efficiency and effectiveness of planning may be measured and improved upon. But what if I told you that such a system already exists? <laughs> what if I told you that a disaster plan can be written very quickly, decided by an entire community, written in multiple languages simultaneously, compliant with FEMA planning guidance, stored in the cloud, searched and sorted and queried like the internet, <clears throat> updated instantaneously, monitored and evaluated automatically using the Internet of Things, integrated as a multi-agency network, and improved upon using artificial intelligence. Would you believe me? Today I'm going to share with you an approach to disaster planning that I think accomplishes all of these things, and I'm going to show you that during these presentations. Our discussion today is based upon my new book entitled Disaster Planning, A Practical Guide for Effective Outcomes. It's due for release in October of 2021. So let's talk about the principles behind disaster planning. Perhaps no emergency management course can be complete without mention of the principle called management by objectives. This approach was invented by Peter Drucker in 1954 and was the first management system to set goals that included input from the workers themselves. Drucker proposed this input because it allowed for a more decentralized approach, just like this photograph here. In effect, it integrated workers as part of the command and control system right from the beginning. And we can see other examples of management science used to develop U.S. policies for emergency management. The figure on the left here in this example represents the U.S. National Preparedness System. Whereas the figure on the right, of course, you'll recognize as we just discussed, DeGroote's and Deming's PDA cycle. Compare the two and you'll see that the similarity is actually, of course, intentional. In the early 20th century, a scientist named Fail identified five functions as a manager, and one of them included planning, creation of plans. And Fail also described operations as a system with three components, resources, processes, and objectives. And we can also view emergency operations as a system as well with three components, resources, processes, and objectives with their associated inputs and outputs and outcomes. Resources are the inputs we put into the system. Outputs are those accomplishments that occur during the process itself. And outcomes occur as a result of those processes and any inputs and are the result of meeting our objectives. Processes, let's talk a little bit about that because I'm going to use that word a lot. Processes are the way that we coordinate these inputs and these examples include personnel or equipment or time or funding. We use these inputs to accomplish the intended outcomes and these outcomes can include sheltering or medical care or water for these disaster affected populations. And process control is actually a management function. It's that control function, one of the fails five functions that I mentioned earlier. It involves using corrective actions based on the results of a monitoring process. So for many years now, planners have recognized a hierarchy that includes strategic, operational, and tactical levels of plans. And this table dis depicts actually three levels of plan hierarchy. You see that processes are also known as tactics. And in this uh, particular table, activities are also known as tasks. 
We can also measure the performance of processes and operations and strategies according to the measures of efficiency, effectiveness, and functional ability. We can also measure the work in terms of outputs and outcomes and capabilities. <clears throat> and with the operational period for processes typically runs from hours to days and is usually depicted by an incident action plan or IAP as many of you know. In comparison, emergency operation plans or EOPs are typically activated over days or months. And finally, strategic plans often pertain to multiple years, with one example including the National Response Framework. U.S. National Preparedness Goal organizes 32 capabilities into five mission areas, including prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. This goal has changed our approach to preparedness, actually. In the past, preparedness was seen as one of four stages in the emergency management cycle, as shown here on the left. And from this view, preparedness was seen as the stage before response. However, this has changed. In the figure on the right, preparedness is depicted as a cross-cutting entity for five separate mission areas, prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. In other words, we prepare to prevent, we prepare to protect, we prepare to mitigate, we prepare to respond, and we prepare to recover. Preparedness this way is treated as a stage of capacity building rather than a separate phase of the cycle itself. <clears throat> So we've identified eight principles for effective planning that I refer to in the acronym TARGET UP. So I'd like to talk with you about those. First off, planning should be targeted to the need. So what's the mission area? Is it prevention, protection, mitigation, response, or recovery? Second, the plan must be accurately informed. It should be based upon the evidence available, not just a wild hmm, guess. <laughs> Next, the plan must be realistic. It should describe what we will do, not what we wish we would do. And the plan must be goal-oriented. Many times, the activities may need to be adjusted and changed, so goals help us to identify different paths, different paths, I should say, to the same outcome. And next, planning has to be efficient. It typically involves a lot of people that are already very busy. Plans should also be time-based. While it's nearly impossible to write a plan that describes the order in which all these activities may be accomplished, it's still possible to estimate the time that each one of these activities will require when it's executed. And this time estimate then allows incident managers to better align their own resources. The next principle for effective planning is the requirement that a plan must be usable. People must be able to access it, understand it, carry out their own roles and responsibilities. And then the final principle for effective planning is that plans must be written for the position of the responder, not their name, of course, as most of you know. People change their jobs and while the role of these individual positions remains relatively stable. The O2C3 approach is another good reminder that effective plans are objective-based, that is including SMART objectives, written at the operational level, consensus-based, capability-based, and compliant with national strategies and norms. Objective-based planning is a critical component of management by objectives, of course. An operational level community-based planning is an important part of current U.S. emergency management. Capability-based planning provides the common framework used for relating and comparing disparate elements of U.S. emergency response organizations. Capability, in other words, is the currency of NIMS. 
And with respect to public health capabilities, while the hazards that cause disasters may vary greatly, the potential public health consequences and subsequent public health and medical needs of the populations, those don't change much. All hazard preparedness programs focus on the expected consequences, not the specific hazard. This table reveals the public health consequences associated with natural disasters. The more serious concerns are identified in red and orange, with lesser issues in white and green. I know it's a busy chart, but a quick look will tell us that nearly all the different disaster hazards along the top line cause the public health consequences listed in the far left column. The difference is only one of scale, of size. For example, floods, hurricanes, and landslides all displace people from their homes and all require the same capability of shelter. The difference is in the scale. Does that make sense? So regardless of the hazard, nearly all disasters can be considered to cause about 15 public health consequences, and these consequences can be addressed by about 32 core capabilities. This figure depicts three different plans, and I use it in a, to give an example of capability-based planning. The two columns on the outside represent scenario-based plans involving, on the left, pandemic influenza, and on the right, drought. The middle column represents an all-hazard capability-based plan. We can see that by writing one all-hazard capability-based plan, we may use the same plan to address even multiple and yet even unforeseen hazards. So let me first take a moment to clarify what I mean when I talk about capability, because oftentimes people use the word interchangeably with capacity. <clears throat> I define capability as the ability to achieve a certain outcome or goal. In comparison, capacity is co the combination of resources available to achieve a certain goal. In simplest terms, capability is an ability while capacity is a maximum rate that the capability can actually be performed over time. I know that's kind of confusing, so let's take a look at an example, okay? Water is a critical need for populations that are displaced by disasters. In this sense, water is considered a core capability. The pipeline in this figure has the capability to deliver water. However, it has the capacity that is measured as a rate in number of gallons per hour. Does that make sense? So consensus-based planning is the other part of the O2C3. Consensus-based planning allows the various stakeholders to negotiate the terms of this new and less familiar paradigm for social and professional interaction that's called a disaster response, right? And consensus is actually a group decision-making process that originated with the Quakers. It seeks not only for agreement of most participants, but also to resolve or mitigate any objections from the minority and to achieve the most agreeable decision among everyone. Homeland Security Presidential Directive No. 8 actually charged federal agencies involved in emergency response to participate in emergency planning on a consensus basis. And a written plan, of course, is only one outcome of the planning process. Planning provides an important opportunity to build partnerships, and it can also help organizations to improve their own decision making. And compliance is a disaster concern as the third C of the O2C3. And it's a concern partly because of the ever-increasing number of guidelines and regulations, I know I don't have to tell you, that require organizations to fully understand their requirements. Conversely, we must also develop disaster plans that will just merely ensure compliance by following them. Planning should sure compliance by default. 
Plans are also reflections of culture. Plans must be compliant with local cultural norms. We've all learned that during COVID, haven't we? And special attention should be paid to local variations in these social and cultural norms so that plans can reflect the true intent of the individuals and the organizations they are intended to serve. Community engagement really helps a lot for us to elicit those local norms and to integrate those into the plans. So in the next video, we'll talk more about these best practices for disaster planning. And I'll share with you one of the newest best practices, an automated disaster evaluation and planning system, also known as ADEPT. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate your time.